Okay, we don't have is a good back channel. Audio's on? Yes, yes. Okay, everyone. Uh, for those tuned into the YouTube live stream, uh, we hope this is all working. Uh, this is the first time we're doing this. Uh, my name is Philip Schmidt. And I'm Claudia Lea. And we're sitting here in the Media Lab uh, at MIT on the sixth floor. And we've been running around a little bit, uh, making sure that the broadcast is working and, and uh, all the encoding machines are hooked up and all the pipes are stuck together. And so um, we wanted to take a few minutes at the beginning today to talk a little bit about logistics and um, some of the kind of technical details of how the course works and how the streaming works. And then at 10.15, we're going to go, we're kind of behind the scenes of the learning, creative learning course at the moment. We're going to go next door, which is where the session takes place um, and which is where the, all the sessions will take place in the next few weeks. Um, and we're going to uh, uh, listen into Mitch's introduction of what the course will be about. Um, we'll go through all the weeks and um, kind of get to know a little bit more um, the structure of the course and um, really also get a sense of the scope of, of what we're going to be doing together. And so Claudia and I thought it'd be good because this is the first time talk a little bit about the online component and also how can you interact with the uh, sessions, what if you miss the sessions. Um, and I guess to start off, the, the most important thing is if, uh, if you, we're going to give a lot of links and, and suggestions and so the best way to follow that, you don't have to take notes for everything, but is to follow the at Media Lab course Twitter account or look for the announcements in the Google Plus community. And the Google Plus community is linked to from the top navigation bar of the course homepage. So if you go to learn.media.mit.edu, click on Google Plus community. If you're not already a member, um, we invite you to join. And there's an announcements section where all the links and things we're going to be talking about now, we're going to be posting them in there so you can follow up. Um, do you want to say something about the annotation? Uh, so yes, we have a link to the transcription of this live seminar in the Google Plus communities. That's for our hearing impaired participants. We also have a back channel for discussion. That link is also in the Google Plus announcements. And that's through hip chat, a chat room for all of you to discuss the seminar. And actually it would be great if people who are watching this and who are in hip chat, if you could give a window open. Um, if you could let us know if the sound is okay or if there are any problems with the sound. It has a title. Um, did you post the link in here? Uh, to the stream? Yes, it's above. Um, Our sound is fine. Great. Thank you for your response. <laughs> awesome, awesome. This is really, really awesome. Um, because it's actually a little, uh, I don't know uh, how many of you have done this, but it's a little strange because you're sitting here in a, we're sitting here in a completely empty room and uh, we're talking to probably about a thousand people but we have no way of knowing and so thanks for the quick response it's super helpful anyway let's run through the logistics uh, quickly uh, we we want to get into the course um, so one thing is we started at 10 o'clock uh, US Eastern time today um, the future sessions are going to start at quarter past 10 and they're going to run for about an hour, so from 10.15 till 11.15. <laughs> and obviously, I guess okay. um, this should be there. And obviously, that will um, uh, uh, change depending on your local time zone, but um, the, the times are always US East Coast times. Um, so we've talked about the back channel. It's the hip chat. If you want to make uh, suggestions or something, do, especially during the session, uh, we will be looking at that and, and hopefully helping out if people have problems. Um, and also, this part of the video will probably cut it out after we've done this and make the session available as a separate one hour long file for those who've, who've missed it. So, um, so let me say a little bit about what we're doing today, how the future sessions work, um, and kind of get us started. So today is a, is a very unusual session because it's the introduction. And it's going to be mostly Mitch speaking about the course. 
uh, he's going to uh, invite some of us to say a few things about the online component uh, and, and different bits and pieces, but it's more going to be a presentation of, of creative learning, uh, which is very different from all the other weeks, uh, which will be panel discussions between some people who get invited and who are here locally, and then some people who will Skype in remotely. And each week has a theme that's related to creative learning, and the, uh, there'll be a panel discussion. There'll also be some readings that people can do um, during the week. There'll be a prompt for a reflection, and uh, there will be an activity that people can uh, engage in that's related to the theme. So it's all very hands-on and, and, and practical, and we don't want this to be a kind of a broadcast type. You're sitting in a lecture and you're listening. We want this to be your course, and uh, almost not really like a course that you, in the traditional sense, but really more something that you can bring to life. You can work on projects you care about and interact with other people who, who are uh, doing this with you. Um, a few quick stats about the course. Uh, we've had 24,000 people sign up, which is um, very exciting and slightly terrifying. Uh, and um, what's different about this course from other very large online courses is that we think there's cer a certain amount of magic that happens if you're learning with a smaller group of other people that you get to know really well. And so we've grouped everyone who signed up into these smaller groups. Uh, we tried to do it either by personal preference, so if you wanted to be grouped with your friends, we tried to do that, or otherwise by time zone, so that at least you're, there's, you're more likely to be online at the same time. And so those groups are really the, the core unit of interaction in this course, and we'll be sending all the announcements and all the prompts and all the instructions to those groups by email. And then secondly, there's a Google Plus community, because what's great about the small group is that, is that level of intimacy and kind of giving each other feedback and getting to know each other's work. But what's awesome about 24,000 people is the level of diversity and, and vibrancy and activity, and also if you have a question, you're very likely to get an answer very, very quickly. So besides those small mailing list groups, we also have a very large Google Plus community, which already has over 5,000 people subscribed to it, and it's linked to from the course homepage. So if you're not in that community yet, we invite you to join it. It's completely overwhelming. The notific you have to filter the notifications out because otherwise your email inbox will explode. Um, but it's also very exciting, and it's amazing to see uh, where all the people who are in this community come from. Um, so maybe one quick uh, word about uh, what we're doing here uh, and kind of the approach we've taken. Um, we've said this in all the communication and the emails, but I can't stress it enough. This is a big experiment, and we are experimenting together with you. Uh, we've invited you to join us for this course and we're testing out a lot of new ideas of how online learning could work, and we're hoping to get more ideas from you. Um, but uh, we will switch things around. Sometimes things may not work as well as we wish they would, and probably as you wish they would. And we hope that you'll be patient with us sometimes. We're really trying our best, and that you will be curious and um, will want to innovate and experiment with us. And we're very much looking for your suggestions, and also we've designed the course in a way that you can change a lot of it. If you think there's a tool that's missing, you can just start using it with your group. If you think there's a resource that's missing, just post a link to it and other people can find it. So the whole thing is really designed to be very malleable and very much controlled and, and uh, driven by you, the, the participants. Um, and also, we wanted this to be a model uh, in a way that other people could replicate. So we're only using open source software or free services. Um, we are making all the content available openly, so you, know, you could just take all the content and run this course again if you wanted. Um, and we're going to be documenting the tools that we're using and how that's going. Um, but we've, you know, we've, cho we've specifically chosen a a an approach that we hope other people will build on and improve and, and riff on, rather than trying to create our own closed platform that we control that no one else could be using, or uh, at least not without our permission. And so, this is kind of a model, uh, hopefully, for lots of other courses that you will be running in the future. Um, okay, are we looking for time? We're going to have to head over there in just three or four minutes. Um, but I wanted to uh, say a couple of things about the structure each week. Um, so we will be sending out one or two emails to each group 
during the week. And those emails will kind of lay out what's happening in that week. We will also paste the um, content of those emails on the course homepage, and we will link to it in the Google Plus community. So we'll, we'll try to make sure you, 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 you get the content that you need. But um, the, the emails will basically list a few readings that you can do that week. Uh, uh, they'll usually have a, a question kind of for reflection that you could post the answer to in your group and discuss with the other people. Um, and then they'll map out an activity that we, would, we invite you to do. Um, and those activities are often hands-on and using a range of different tools. We're using Scratch, for example, for some of them. And, um, there's a, 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 but there really is a, a wide diversity of tools. And they're designed to kind of experience that aspect of creative learning that we're talking about in that week. And again, many of those activities will have a, an output or some kind of a result that we hope you will share with your group and you'll uh, explain kind of why you took a certain approach or also where you had problems maybe and try to get some feedback and help from the others. Um, help is actually a good topic. Uh, if you get stuck or you have a question, or you're not sure about something, what's the right strategy to, to deal with that? So there's an, there are a number of channels. Your immediate email group is probably your best first channel because those are the people that are going at the same speed with you that you probably got to know over the week. So definitely ask them. The Google Plus community is another great venue, um, especially if you need quick feedback. There are lots of people in there all the time. We've posted things in there. and. Uh, uh, actually things that didn't work, we posted a Google Calendar that wasn't public and literally within two seconds we had a reply from someone who said it's not public uh, and then we made it public and then another two seconds later we had a reply, it's working now and it was amazing. So that's the Google Plus community is a good place. Um, Twitter, if you use the Media Lab course hashtag, we'll be scanning that as well. Um, and then finally there's an email account, Media Lab course at p2pu.org. But that really is kind of the last resort. We're completely overwhelmed with emails. And we will try to get back to all of the kind of unresolved questions. But please try to work with your group in the, in the Google Plus community first, um, especially if you're, if you're trying to get a, a fast response. Um, so I think the last thing I want to mention, and we're going to put the link into both the um, hip chat and also the Google Plus community. But we invite all of you to introduce yourselves. Um, both by email in your groups, but also on the Google Plus community. But then we thought it would be kind of neat to have a gallery of little videos where people talk about why they're excited to be joining this course and maybe where they're from. And, um, really very, very short, no longer than you know, maybe 20 seconds or max 30 seconds. And we've put up a little form where you can put in your name, you can put in your location, and a link to the video. It can be on YouTube or on Vimeo. And then we will be compiling all of those videos into one huge gallery that kind of hopefully is exciting to check out and reflect and kind of see the diversity in the, in the community. Um, so I think with that, I would like to say welcome to this course. Uh, welcome to experimenting with us. Um, I think we're going to have an amazing time trying this out together. It's exciting uh, that we can all uh, invent the future of social learning online. Um, and we're going to head over into the main room now for the uh, session one introduction of learning creative learning. Before we do that, did I forget anything or do you want to add anything? I think that's it. We're just really excited to have such a diverse group of people and I think we should head out. Cool. We're ready for us to start. Let's switch over. So give us a few seconds and then we'll be back with you. Website for the online course is learn.media.mit.edu.
the answer to this question is that there's been some steps to go deeply indebted to the, the group is doing the whole infrastructure for trying to make okay, this happen. Right. Okay, yes. Go for the audio. Was it working before? Okay. Are you okay, ready? Cool. What's that? Ready? ready? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay, I want to welcome everybody to the course Learning Creative Learning. I want to welcome those here at MIT. Uh, who are officially registering for a class at MIT, but also want to be welcoming those of you who are watching this online. Uh, you know, I've taught courses similar to this a number of times in the past, but we're doing something different this semester. In addition to the local course here, we did invite people online to be able to participate. And hopefully it'll be a great learning experience both for people taking the course officially here at MIT, but also a great learning experience for those who are joining us online. We also think it'll be a great learning experience for us because we're learning a lot about how to provide new types of learning opportunities using the new technologies that are available today. And I hope through the course of the semester, we'll all learn a lot about ways of being able to provide new learning opportunities online. Uh, I'll be organizing the course together with a few other people. I know those of you online have already met with Philip Schmidt, who's particularly organizing the online part of the course. Natalie Rusk will also be you know, working together in running the course. We have a couple teaching assistants, Rika Rosroke and Shaimindu Dashgupta, who will be helping with the class. But we'll be saying more about the organization of the class later on in this session, in particular how there's some differences in how it's organized for the local group and for the online group. But to get started, I thought it would be uh, more important to start with some of the content of the class about what do we really mean when we talk about learning creative learning. So let me start with the story. It's a story that uh, took place a few years ago when I visited the small country of Singapore. And many of you know Singapore has been very successful economically over the last couple decades, has, uh, has seen as a real success story economically. Uh, also educationally, the students in Singapore score at the top of a lot of the international exams. But a few years ago, the government of Singapore saw that there was, uh, they started hearing some complaints from the business community in Singapore. A lot of the businesses said that even though the students were getting some of the highest scores on the international exams, when the students graduated and then entered the workforce, they weren't very well prepared for the real needs of the, of the workplace that they knew very well how to do some very specific tasks that, in fact, that they had been tested on. But when new challenges arose, uh, they were sort of stuck. They didn't know how to adapt to changing situations. So the government was starting to realize that they needed to do something different in their education system. And they needed to provide more support to help young people develop as creative thinkers. And I think the government saw that they wanted to bring about some type of change in helping how they could help young people develop as creative thinkers so that they could come up with innovative solutions uh, when new types of unexpected challenges would arise. So since I've been doing some work in that area, they invited me to come over and visit and to have some discussions with them about this. And they brought me to a school to look at some of the things going on in the school. In fact, I met this young student. I think he was 13 years old at the time. And he was the National Junior Robotics Champion. I, I often get introduced to robotics champions since our group has been involved with, the, in, with LEGO and developing LEGO Mindstorm. So when I travel, they trot out the National Junior Robotics Champions. But actually, as, as I talked to him and his classmates, actually, I was very impressed with the things they were doing. They'd come up with some very creative designs. And as there were new challenges presented, and as I talked to them, they came up with new ways of changing their robotic devices and changing the programming. So I thought they were doing very creative work. And I talked to the teacher in the classroom, and I you know, said that I was impressed by what I had seen. And I asked her, I said, I'm curious, you know, how is it that you've integrated this into the classroom? And she looked at me like I was crazy, and she said, there's no way we do this in the classroom. This is only for after school. During the classroom, they must be drilled on their math activities. Uh, and for me, it was really this striking divide that here was an activity which I clearly saw as supporting the development of creative thinking. The teachers and the, the, clearly recognized some value to it. They were providing us after-school activity. 
but they still said, no way we would do this during the school day. And I think we do see this tension in the world that a growing number of people recognize that we need to do something different, that the world has changed. We're in a, a world that's changing more rapidly than ever before. If things are changing rapidly, then learning a fixed set of facts and skills isn't going to be good enough, that we need to be able to have people adapt to changing situations. And yet people still hold on tightly to old ways of doing things, uh, even in the face of it not providing the, the type of uh, you know, outcomes that we would like. So in this course, I think one thing we will be looking at is you know, how is it that we can start to think differently about learning to be able to provide the opportunities for young people like this, to be able to be prepared for a society that is going to require and value creative thinking more than ever before. Now, you know, why is it that you know, the, the school in Singapore was holding on to this you know, notion that during the school day that the students must be drilled on their math exercises? I mean, I think part of the answer is that a lot of people have this model of learning that it's just that you learn things when information gets delivered to you. It's a model that looks something like this, that if you just you know, have the student and you just deliver the right types of information, uh, then that's the way you really will get people well prepared. Uh, and for many years, you know, people have, you know, teachers have been delivering information this style. Too often when we develop new technologies, we just fit new technologies into this old framework. And we just have technologies deliver information you know, to students. And I think you know, in this class, we're trying to call into question this model of learning and think about how can we think about learning differently so that it really does prepare people as adaptive, creative thinkers. And in our research group, as we've thought about this question over the years, we've drawn a lot of our inspiration from the ways children learn in kindergarten. In fact, we've drawn so much inspiration, we call our research group the lifelong kindergarten group. Because we think that we can learn a lot of lessons from the way that children learn in kindergarten. Because we think kindergarten puts children to a, off to a good start in developing as creative thinkers. And part of it is you think about the root of the word creative. It's about create. And in kindergarten, at least traditional kindergartens, kids spend a lot of time creating things. They might be creating towers out of wooden blocks, creating pictures with finger paints and crayon. Uh, and they do this in collaboration with one another. And in the process, they learn important ideas. They learn about number and shape and size and color. But maybe even more important, they start to learn to become creative thinkers, to start with an idea and develop it into a project. So one thing that we think about, and will be a core idea that continues through this whole course, is how can we take this kindergarten style of learning and make it possible for everybody to be able to benefit from this type of style of learning. And in some ways, we're fighting against some trends in doing this. Because you know, as some of you know, if you've interacted with kindergartens recently, a lot of kindergartens don't look like this anymore. Increasingly, children in kindergarten are spending their time with phonics worksheets and math activities. Uh, and in some ways, kindergarten is becoming somewhat more like the rest of school. And I think what we're interested in in this class is to see how can we make the rest of school and more importantly the rest of life somewhat more like kindergarten. And well, what do we mean by that? When we think about this kindergarten style of learning, um, well, this I know that on the website there was a there's a, a link to an article about the kindergarten style of learning that's up there that you can take a look at. Uh, and some of you know have already read it. It goes through what we see as the kindergarten style of learning that we capture in this creative learning spiral. And it starts with the imagination. And if you picture kindergarten, uh, that kids might come in one day and they've imagined building a fantasy city. But it's not enough just to have the imagination, that you have to then create something based on your ideas. So they might pull out the blocks and start building the city. And as they start creating, it's not just that they create something to spec and then they're finished. They play with their creations. And when we think about play, we think of play as a form of experimentation, of trying new things, of testing the boundaries. So you'll see kids trying different ways of building buildings uh, or, and putting the blocks together in different ways. That's a playful experimentation that's an important part of the process. They'll start sharing with one another. 
they might work together in a building. Or if someone's building the building, someone else will build a road with cars in front of the building. Now, probably in most kindergarten classrooms, as this is happening, things will go wrong and somebody will knock over one of the towers. Um, but that also provides a good opportunity for reflection. And as a tower gets knocked over, they'll say, well, how can we do this differently? Um, and the teacher might come over with pictures of skyscrapers, and the students might notice that they're wider at the base than at the top. And they might come up with you know, thinking that, well, maybe we should build our buildings that way with a stronger base. And that triggers their imagination. They start again. So and there's a spiraling process of going through this. And of course, it's not in a linear order, as this might apply. All of this is more mixed together. But it is this constant spiral or iterations of trying things out, learning from the experience, learning from your collaboration with others, sparking new ideas, doing it again. And we see this happening in kindergartens. We also, I think, this is the core of our approach here at the MIT Media Lab, that the work at the Media Lab follows the same approach. Now, the students here, they don't just work with wooden blocks and finger paint. They're working with microcontrollers and laser cutters and 3D printers. But the process is the same of starting with ideas, rapidly creating prototypes, collaborating with others, getting feedback from others, iterating over and over. So we see that happening. We do think that that's what leads to a lot of the innovation that comes from a place like the Media Lab. So we see that traditional kindergartens work, and we think the Media Lab works, and we just have to change everything else. And that's part of what this course is about, is how we can take these ideas and help other people be able to you know, integrate these ideas into their situations. Of course, different situations are different, and it will require different ways of appropriating these ideas into different contexts for learners of different ages and in different situations. Now, there's also a strong focus in this class of how technologies can make a difference in supporting this type of learning spiral. And that's partly because we think that a reason that the kindergarten approach hasn't been more widely adopted is that we haven't had the right media and the right technologies. If all you have are wooden blocks and finger paint, that's great for learning kindergarten level concepts like number and shape and size and color. But as you get older, and you want to work on more advanced projects, you need more advanced tools and technologies. And if they haven't been there in the past, people shift over to delivering information as a way of, 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 of learning. But we think if we use new technologies the right way, we can extend this kindergarten approach to learners of all ages to let people build more advanced projects, learn more advanced ideas, still using this kindergarten approach. But of course, unfortunately, that's not the way most technologies get used today. Uh, it, uh, we do know that technologies have proliferated, and they're ubiquitous in almost everyone's lives in many parts of the world. As young people grow up today, many young people do have lots of interaction with technology. But oftentimes, they interact with technology this way, by you know, playing games, by chatting with one another, texting one another. In classroom settings, it might look like this, where they're sort of you know, staring into a screen, oftentimes cut off with headphones, oftentimes having information delivered to them. And again, computers can do a great job of delivering information. And sometimes that can be useful. But it's not what's going to really transform our approach to learning. It's not what's going to be, you know, it's not going to be something that really prepares people for a society that will require creative thinking more than ever before. So we'll be thinking about how to bring very different images of technology into the learning process. So for example, some of the pro projects we've worked on that have grown out of the robotics project that we saw in Singapore, we've been taking technologies like that and saying, how can they be brought into the lives of all types of people for all types of projects? It's like, here's a project we worked on a, in, the, in the few years ago. It was taking a smaller type of programmable brick that you could program to get information from the world through sensors and control things in the world. This is from a workshop in Hong Kong where this girl used one of these programmable bricks to control lights that she put on her boots and had a sensor. So as you walk, the lights, she programmed it so the lights would turn different colors based on how she walked. And again, she was inspired by the lights that are on many kids' shoes these days. But you don't have any control over that. With the typical products on the market, you wear the shoes and the lights light up and it's flashy, but you don't get to have any control. You're not the one that gets to express yourself. 
So we want to provide kids as they grow up, they're the ones to give them, the, we want to give them the opportunities to create and experiment and explore with the technology. Whether it's putting lights in your boots, or at the same workshop, this boy made a, a mobile jukebox, a wearable jukebox, and he used a sensor so that when you put a coin in, it would detect what coin it was and play different music based on what type of coin you put in. Or here's a workshop in Iceland where this girl built uh, an alarm system to protect her room from her brother. So it had a light sensor that if someone breaks the beam of light, it would sound an alarm. Or at the same workshop in Iceland, this was an alarm clock bed so that it was used a light sensor so if the light comes in the window, it would hit the light sensor, turning on a motor to ruffle his hair and playing music to wake him up. Well, actually, the part of this story that I liked best was after he made his first prototype, he showed it, and someone said, wait a minute, there's a problem. You know, you know, here in Iceland, the sun, we're so far north, the sun usually doesn't come in the window at the time you want to wake up. Uh, it so varies from one part of the year to another. So we thought about that, and at the final presentation at the end of the workshop, when each of the students demonstrated their creation and also made a poster, on his poster he explained how his alarm clock worked, and at the top he wrote, for export only. And again, for me, that was, again, part of that creative learning spiral. He shared with others, got feedback, reflected on what they said, and, and thought about how could he connect with the people who are going to be using it. And part of that design process is thinking about your audience. So you know, these are some examples of technologies to engage people in designing and creating things in the physical world. You know, these days, of course, people spend a lot of time interacting online and in virtual worlds. So we also want to make sure that people have an opportunity to design, create, and express themselves online and not just be pointing and clicking and browsing and chatting. So that was one of our goals in working on the Scratch programming environment and online community. So with Scratch, and you'll get a chance to be trying this out during the semester if you haven't tried it already, um, with Scratch, young people, or people of all ages, but it's especially designed for ages eight and up, can create their own interactive stories and games and animations, and then share their creations online with one another on the Scratch website. So kids create their uh, projects by snapping together blocks, somewhat like Lego bricks, but these blocks describe the behavior for each of the characters in their story or game. In this case, it's a fish you can control to eat other fish in the game. After you make your project, you click on share, and it shares your project on the Scratch website. Someone like uploading a video to YouTube, but in this case, it's your own interactive creation. So with Scratch, again, our goal was to have young people be able to express themselves and develop as creative thinkers as they do so. Just to give you a sense of it, let me tell a story about one member of the Scratch online community. This is one of the early members of the community. When the, the community launched about five years ago, and one of the early participants was, at the time, a 12-year-old whose username was My Red Neptune. And one of her first projects was this. It was a holiday card, and when you click on each reindeer, plays a different part of the song. So she created this project and put it online and then you know, sent a link to her friends so her friends would get her holiday greeting. But as My Red Neptune worked on this, she realized that what she really enjoyed doing most was making the individual characters like the individual reindeer and the Santa Claus character. So she started putting up projects on the website like this. They were just a collection of characters. We call them sprites and scratch. And then in, their no in the notes for the project, she said, if you like my characters, please feel free to use them in your project. If you want a different character, write a comment below, and I'll make a character for you. So basically, she was offering her consulting services in the online community. So again, it was a new way of sharing and her going through the spiral of not just creating, but sharing with, each, with others in the community. And sure enough, 
other people started making requests. Someone said they wanted a cheetah for their game. So My Red Neptune went and found a video of a cheetah online and made an animated version that she then shared and for someone else to use inside of their game. Another person asked My Red Neptune to make a bird with flapping wings. So she made that, and the other community member was happy with it. But then the community member wrote back and said, I'd like to learn how to do this myself. Can you show me how you made the bird with flapping wings? So My Red Neptune put up a tutorial, a step-by-step -step tutorial, showing how she had drawn the wing and then how she had animated the wing. So within, within a matter of months, My Red Neptune had made holiday cards, offered her consulting services, you know, started working on projects for others, made tutorials to help others understand how to, how to do things in new ways. She also started collaborating with others in the community on joint projects. Here's one project that she worked on where there, I think there were five different young people from three different countries who came together to work on an adventure style game where My Red Neptune designed the characters, someone else designed the background, someone else did the music. So they worked together, put this up, and then actually made a website for their company. They called it Crank Inc., uh, where they were going to sort of highlight and showcase their games for others to see. So I hope you get some sense just from these examples of some of the possibilities of how to support people developing as creative thinkers, whether it's in the physical world, building alarm clock beds or you know, online. And I think that starts to get at what we're looking at in this course of how can we support more people to have these types of experiences. And for us to get a better understanding of these experiences and what is it that, young, that people gain from these experiences. So as we think about learning creative learning, we'll be looking at creative learning experiences like the ones we I was just talking about. But the point of the course is learning about the creative learning experiences, hence the name Learning Creative Learning. We'll be looking at the educational ideas that underlie the creative learning process. And we'll be looking at design principles for how to design new technologies and new activities to support and foster and encourage people in the creative design process. Uh, so in doing this, to really have a good understanding of this, we need lots of different backgrounds and different perspectives. To really support the creative learning process, it's not just a matter of the technology design or understanding the learning process or, you know, or thinking about the, the, the look and feel of the interface. All of these are important. And in the course, we want to cut across different disciplines to bring in many different you know, backgrounds and different perspectives to, to, that are needed in order to have this type of new learning experience. So in putting together the course, we have a, a group of us working together on the course that each of us brings our own backgrounds and motivations and perspectives on the creative learning process. You know, for myself, I started out you know, with a background in the sciences. I majored in physics in college. But after college, I worked for a number of years as a journalist writing about science and technology. I covered Silicon Valley in the early 1980s. And I think that one thing that drew me to journalism was my desire to help people understand things. And journalism is one way of helping people understand things. But I was never fully satisfied with just writing an article and putting it out there to the world. Uh, again, it felt a little bit like that delivery of information style of learning. And I got really inspired in the mid-1980s by the work of Seymour Papert, who was one of the great pioneers of technology and learning and really help bring out the idea of how technology could empower people to design, create, and express themselves and learn through those processes. So I came to MIT to study with Seymour Papert and others uh, and have been here for almost 30 years now of continuing to work on these types of ideas. And it always takes new forms, but the core motivations for me are always the same. Uh, luckily, in this course, you know, we have a group of you know, that they were put together with, again, can bring in different perspectives on it. And we'll say a little bit to Natalie Rusk is another one of the facilitators of the, of the class. And she'll say a little bit about her background. Hi. 
So I'm Natalie Rusk. I'm a research scientist in the Lifelong Kindergarten group. And I actually first came to the Media Lab for a course like this more than 20 years ago that Seymour Papert was offering. And Mitch was a graduate student then, um, almost finished with his PhD. And one of the things that really drew me into that work was to hear the aspect of Seymour Papert and others here talking about what, not just how kids learn, but why they learn, what's motivating the learning. And he was talking about um, kid culture, how ideas spread so quickly between among friends or someone that you're related to or that you care about, you start wanting to learn, and you, you gain a relationship with the topic. And I found that really resonated with my own experience and seeing others. So all along, I've been collaborating with Mitch ever since that course. Together, we started the Computer Clubhouse. And I know some of the Computer Clubhouse coordinators are participating online. And we'll probably hear from some of them. From um, I started that within museums. So I worked for about 10 years applying these ideas about creative learning with other of my colleagues in the museum world, again, who are also going to be participating online. And then came back here and started working together, developing the Pico Cricket programmable brick technologies and Scratch, but also studying. I got really involved in studying more about motivation and emotion. How does emotion, and um, I get so excited in that creative learning spiral, that initial, you'll sometimes see a kid who's in a workshop at the beginning who looks not so engaged, they're kind of there, and then suddenly their face lights up and they know what they want to make. They see the materials, they've heard what the theme is, and they, and they have an idea, and their energy just changes, and that motivation takes them through the process. Sometimes in that spiral, as you're creating, you get frustrated. <laughs> Your creation uh, that you're building might fall apart, drive off the table, or fly apart, and um, that frustration, I've been really interested to see Sometimes kids will want to give up, never mind, I don't want to make it. But other times they're like, oh, it's OK. You know, I know, I, I learned something, now I can rebuild it. And how do we help more young people get to that point where they're like, OK, I learned something from that, and then I want to keep working with others and keep rebuilding. So I'm really looking forward to the participation here and online, hearing people's experiences, both themselves as learners, through this process, but also what they see and apply with youth that they're working with. Okay. Next, another sort of facilitator in the class will be Philip Schmidt, who, as I mentioned earlier, had started P2PU and is really taking the lead on the online version of the class. Sure, thanks. And I'll be super quick. Um, I, yeah, as you said, I started P2P University. I'm uh, interested in and excited by. Uh, ways that people can learn with each other online uh, in uh, kind of settings that weren't possible before we had the web. Uh, I come from the open source kind of internet world originally, so I'm not a, a learning and education um, researcher traditionally. I come at this from kind of, I'm interested in collaboration and, and putting people together and, and, and communication and using web tools. And I'm uh, Super excited about having uh, over a thousand people watch us through this camera right now, and it's a little terrifying. <laughs> and uh, if you're having trouble with the hip chat, use IRC. Uh, um, <laughs> and uh, I look forward to uh, kind of experimenting with new ways of bringing courses like this online and, and helping the, the online community primarily. And as I mentioned earlier, we have two TAs for the class. First, Rick Rose Roque. Hi, everyone. My name is Rikros Roque, and I'm a PhD student with the Lifelong Kindergarten Group. I'm really interested in uh, ways we can support kids to create and collaborate together online. Um, but I'm also really interested in how we can broaden participation in creative computing. And I've been working with uh, community centers to design um, to creative technology workshops for families, thinking of how we can leverage kind of the family structure to get uh, families excited about creating together. And then Shaimindu Tashkupta. Uh, hi, I'm Shaimindu. Uh, I grew up in India, uh, Kolkata. And I was uh, a part participant in the open source world in, in India. 
And then I discovered Seymour Papert's work, Mitch's work, and decided to come to the Media Lab where I'm a graduate student right now. Uh, I look at how kids can program and design with data, especially online data, using tools like Scratch, so I kind of design technologies for kids in this area. So Neil, we'll give a, a quick run through of what this semester is going to look like. Um, as we thought about organizing this class, we organized around a variety of different themes uh, that are all relevant for creative learning. Themes like uh, you know, social creativity and tinkering and powerful ideas. And each week of the class, we're going to be focusing on one of these themes. And we'll probe and explore these themes in a number of different ways that one way is through a collection of readings. So on the course website, we'll have a collection of readings each week that, that are ones that those of us who are organizing the class uh, felt were influential to us and helping us think about these ideas. And hopefully it will provoke you know, some new ways of thinking for you. So each week, you'll have a, a, a variety of readings. And we'll try to keep it to a small number of readings with some additional readings that if you want to dive deeper into it, you'll also have an opportunity to go further with that. In addition to those readings, when we have the class each Monday morning, uh, they'll be you know, starting at you know, a little after 10 o'clock here in Boston. The main part that we'll all share together each week online through, through the live streaming video is a panel conversation about the theme. And each week we've invited several people with lots of experience and expertise in the theme to come join us for the first hour of class. And we'll be having a conversation with them about their experiences uh, and their thoughts about these themes. So that hour-long conversation will be live streamed for people online. It will also be archived for people that can't join you know, in time or at that time. So the first hour of class will largely be this panel conversation on the theme with a couple of people who we see as real world experts in those themes. But then we'll also each week have some design-based activities around those themes. We'll be using some of the technologies that we've already mentioned, like Scratch, some other technologies from, the, from our research group here at MIT, that you'll get a chance to be doing some different design activities and learning activities, whether you're just, and trying out new technologies, coming up with designs for new technologies or activities, uh, and thinking about how that, those design processes connect to these core themes of creative learning. We'll also have small group discussions. So that'll take a different form for the local people here at MIT and for the online people. So for the second two hours of the class here at MIT, we'll get together and have small group discussions around the theme and following up on the panel conversation, and also following up on the design-based hands-on activities. And then we'll say more later, but the people online are also going to be divided into small groups where over the course of the week, they can continue the, those conversations as well. And we'll be providing some support and prompts to help support those ways. So I'll go through now, week by week, the different weeks of the class and say a little, little bit about the theme, the visitors for the panel conversations. So it'll just be a very quick run through, but it'll give you at least a, a little bit of a spirit of what lies ahead. So like next week, we'll be having uh, as two visitors, Mimi Ito and Joey Ito. For those who don't know, Joey is the director of the Media Lab here. Uh, Mimi Ito is, again, one of the uh, sort of international leaders in thinking about technology and learning. Uh, she has a background as an ethnographer and has studied uh, you know, different learning experiences by children in different cultures. Uh, so we'll be hearing from them on the theme of interest-based learning. One thing that's always struck me about both of them is how they see the importance of people following their interests and their passions. I think both of them have lived down their own lives and tried to support environments around that. So we'll have some readings about that. They'll talk about it. And I'll definitely want to sort of push them, you know, Mimi and Joey, you know, I think going about this from a different, in somewhat different ways, although they're alike in many ways, they also took their own paths. So we'll be asking them about starting from their early childhood experiences. There's an early photograph of, of Mimi and Joey. 
and we're finding out how they get started and thinking about these interest-driven approaches to learning and how that's taken through to what they do today. Uh, again, let me make note that next week we'll have a special time or a special date. All of the other weeks we'll be meeting on Monday, but next week, because of a holiday, MIT is shifting and the Monday classes will be on Tuesday. So just for next week, we'll meet on Tuesday, February 19th, rather than Monday, February 18th. But then all the future weeks will be on Mondays. The next week after that, we'll be focused on constructionism and making. Constructionism is a term coined by Seymour Papert, who we mentioned before. It really highlights the importance of people learning through designing, creating, and making. And of course, the idea of making is something that's really gotten a higher prominence in the culture in recent years through the maker movement with Maker Fairs and Make Magazine. And it will be great to we'll be joined for the panel discussion by Dale Doherty, who is the founder and editor of Make Magazine, uh, and also by Leah Beakley, professor here at the Media Lab, who's been an, a, a key contributor to the maker movement, especially in broadening participation to see how can we engage a wider range of people in learning through making. As part of the Constructionism and Making Week, we'll, everyone will be working on projects using our Scratch software, and you'll be designing different projects to be introducing things about yourself. And over the course of the semester, you'll also have an opportunity to use the next version of Scratch, which we're working on and will be publicly launched in the coming weeks, what we call Scratch 2.0. And hopefully this will also be something that can lead into the conversation about the design choices we made as we've continued to evolve and iterate Scratch and why are we evolving it in the way we do and how do we make our design choices as we continue to evolve Scratch the same way that the people who use Scratch evolve their own projects, we evolve Scratch itself. And we'll be talking about that during the course of the semester. Session four will focus on the notion of powerful ideas. Seymour Papert's book, Mindstorms, had as its subtitle, Children, Computer, and Powerful Ideas. And when that book came out back in 1980, I think Seymour saw that computers had the opportunity to not just let people create things, but also to connect them with important ideas that would help them understand the world in new ways. And I think that's another dimension of all the work that we do is how can we design things that engage people in exploring and confronting powerful ideas? And we have as our guest panelists two people who've thought a lot about these ideas and have designed different types of toolkits to support exploration of powerful ideas. Alan Kay, who is sometimes seen as the father of the personal computer through his early work at Xerox PARC, uh, did some of the early work in graphical user interfaces and then thinking about how those can be made accessible to broader audiences, including kids. And Brian Silverman, who worked for many years with Seymour Papert on the logo programming language and providing new tools to let kids engage with powerful ideas. The week after that, we'll be on open learning. And Philip will be taking the lead on the open learning week. And maybe, Philip, you want to say a few things about open learning? Um, yeah, I made some notes. Uh, so open can mean many things, but for me, uh, it mainly means uh, low barriers to participation and uh, kind of often somewhat self-emergent uh, ways of uh, structuring communities. So open source software communities are a really good example of this. But also the sense that the people who are participating in these communities collaborate with each other and learn with each other and give each other feedback and it's not a passive uh, uh, participation model so you join a community that is open for people to join but then you participate actively and you get help that you need and you mentor uh, younger participants and there's kind of a, a spirit of collaboration and self-organization that I think is uh, quite interesting and unique in these uh, new communities and so what I want to do is um, I want to start with open source software communities that we've invited Mako um, Hill 
who is the, among many other things, community manager for the Ubuntu community, or used to be, and wrote the kind of principles of that community. So he's an expert in open source software communities. And then, uh, yet to be announced, another person that has applied some of these same principles more in the learning space. So uh, open source software communities are always the example, but there are great examples in that are more education or learning or other areas. And so we're going to kind of look at those principles in, in those. And also some of the activities that the activity that week, we're going to be focusing on how we can help people learn from one another. It sort of draws on the spirit of these images are from an activity here at the Media Lab. It's now an annual event started by some of the Media Lab graduate students called the Festival of Learning. It's really focused on having people in this community learn from one another. And as part of the class for the week on open learning, we're going to be focusing on uh, as the activity to let people in the class be learning from one another and then reflecting on their experience of learning from one another and helping other people learn. The following week focuses on social creativity, about the, the role of social interaction in the creative learning process. Uh, for that week, we have Gerhard Fischer, who from University of Colorado, who's done some of, I think, really interesting work on thinking about, again, the social nature of creativity and how we can engage more people in participation in the learning process. Uh, he draws on the idea that Henry Jenkins put forward about the participatory cultures. And Gerhardt looks, how can we design to support the development of participatory cultures? We'll also be hearing from Andres Manuel Hernandez, who is a former graduate student of mine, uh, who now works at Microsoft Research. He's the one who actually developed the, the the foundations for the Scratch online community and has thought a lot about how to support online collaboration and sharing. And in that week will be, as part of the activities, thinking explicitly about learning through remixing and sharing with one another. The same way this is an image from Andres's work where he traces the flow of ideas through an online community by how people remix each other's work of building on the work of others. So we'll be exploring through our own activities that week of how we can learn through remixing the work of others. The following work will focus on learning in communities. And Nadia will take over. Yeah, so we're excited to have Geeta Narayanan joining us from Bangalore, India. She's been influential in our work and has done a lot of innovative work in developing a school in India, also a College of Art, Design, and Technology, Shrishti, and more recently, which she'll talk about, is a what she calls not school for young people from a um, low-income area where they're designing and learning from each other. So we'll be hearing about, and she often asks about not just our kids learning, but is this transformative? How is it transformative? And we'll be really bringing a creative and challenging perspectives. So I think it's be really interesting. And that week, we'll be asking everyone to go see a local community center wherever you are, online or locally, and share your observations. Some of you are working in them, and others of us will be going and um, observing and sharing our observations out from the community and what you're seeing happening there. This is a picture from the Computer Clubhouse as one example. And then the following week, we'll be talking with Avi Kaplan. I learned about him through my doctoral work studying motivation and learning. And he's a researcher in educational psychology at Temple University. He's been involved in motivation research for a long time and is really pushing that field along, asking to work more applied and looking at, he's interested recently in identity formation how does that happen and how can that kind of creative learning spiral be about figuring out who you are? So he's also joined um, Mitch and I, Amon and others on a panel at the Digital Media and Learning Conference that was raising some questions about badges as a form of motivation. When do those make sense? What are alternatives to that? So he's a provocative thinker and it'll be great to get everyone's uh, voices and thoughts about that together. And that week we'll be asking you for so the time that you learned about something and what motivated you, kept you going. So looking at also some of the recent research on grit and persistence and what keeps people going when they encounter something that's difficult in the learning process. 
the week after that will be focused on the process of tinkering. I think in our group we've always you know, thought about tinkering as a key element of supporting the creative learning approach. And we think that too often when people are trying to support types of learning that they overemphasize a, what, we might, what might be called a planning oriented approach where you come up with a systematic plan, execute, and then finish. Uh, we feel that a lot of the most creative activities take place when people start by messing around, exploring, and constantly adapting and iterating based on what they find through their explorations. So we'll be looking at people who have set up both spaces, activities, and technologies to support the tinkering process. Two longtime collaborators with Natalie and myself are Karen Wilkinson and Mike Petrich, who are from the Exploratorium in San Francisco, where they actually started an area called the Tinkering Studio, where they support uh, this approach to exploration and learning. And they'll be talking about some of their experiences in setting up this space and supporting those activities. We'll also have Eric Rosenbaum, a graduate student here at the Media Lab in my research group, uh, whose, own work, whose own work thinks of, it focuses on designing for tinkerability. How can you design to support the tinkering process? Uh, one of the projects Eric has worked on, along with his close collaborator Jay Silver, is the Makey Makey Kit. And that's at least one of the items we're looking at that week of thinking about how to support and engage in the tinkering process. So we'll have a chance to see how people can use new technologies like Makey Makey to support this type of exploration of possibilities, both in the physical world and also in the digital world. Uh, online, for those who are participating uh, in the online you know, community, realize you might not be able to get access to Makey Makeys, and we'll suggest other ways that you might be able to participate in exploring the ideas of tinkering. Session 10 on May 6th is about supporting creative learning. So how can we create, you know, how can we support the activities that are going on in different types of learning spaces? Uh, as we set up, whether it's inside of school or outside of school or in the home, what is it that we can do as a facilitation and mentoring process to support the ways people develop as creative thinkers and creative learners? And we have two recent graduates from the Lifelong Kindergarten Group at the Media Lab who will be joining us, both of whom have done great work in this area. Karen Brennan, who's now a professor at Harvard Graduate School of Education, developed the Scratch Ed website to support educators who are using Scratch to support learning in their classrooms. And it's done a lot of work of thinking about the type of materials that are useful to support the learning process uh, as people design and create with Scratch. Amon Milner uh, did a lot of work in community centers and really thought a lot about the role of mentors in those centers and how he could both support people developing as mentors who would then support the young people in those centers and the ways of when to engage and when to step back and what are the different roles that people can play in the facilitation process. As the final week of the class, we left the final session for reflection, uh, both looking back at the class looking about the experiences you've had in the class. Uh, for the people working here locally in the class, we'll be looking at some sort of deeper projects we've worked on and have some demonstrations and uh, exhibition of the things that you've worked on during the class, and then reflecting upon looking ahead about from the experiences of the class. We're still figuring out the right form of reflection for the online community, and as the semester goes on, we'll be thinking about what's the right way to support reflection among all of those who are participating online. And I that as we look at this semester, a lot of it will be things that we'll be, that we'll be adapting as the semester goes along. As we ran through the syllabus, we have the basic framework of the syllabus in place. But we also want to warn you that we might be adapting the readings or changing some of the activities as the semester goes on. As we see things, how, working, how things are working during the semester, we take seriously this creative learning spiral, even with the course itself. We'll be iterating with the course as it goes on. And we realize it might be inconvenient for some of you who want to right now be locked down and read ahead and do the activities ahead. 
again, we might have some adjustments, and we hope people will bear with that. We think that's the best way for us to experimentally make a better and better course over time. We hope that you'll join us in the spirit of that experimentation and be willing to adapt as things change over the course of the semester. You know, as we think about it, we will be thinking about how we can adapt the course to work both for the local participants here at MIT and the online participants. Uh, and it really is an experiment because, to be perfectly honest, although we have a lot of experience developing courses like this for local participants, this is a first-time experience working with a large online class, first time for us. So we have a lot to learn. But to be perfectly honest, everyone has a lot to learn about this. You know, recently there's been a lot of excitement and publicity around MOOCs, Massively Open Online Courses, but nobody knows how to do this well. It's still an experiment for everyone. I think everyone has a lot to learn from one another. And I think we want to use this course as a way for us to apply some of our creative learning principles to how we might come up with better ways of developing online courses. Now, there's certain types of courses, like a big lecture course where someone just stands up and lectures the whole time. It, in some ways, is easier to translate over into a massively open online course. You video the person talking, put it online, and that's a big part of what the course is about. Maybe you have some automatic grading of, the, of people's responses to exercises. But a course like this, when we've run it in the past, it's really been focused around small group interaction and conversation and hands-on activity. And to be honest, we do think that's a bigger challenge to convert, to translate that in something that works well online. But we're interested in trying to figure out the way of doing it. And we want to take some of those core elements that we've seen working in our local classes and see how can that work online. So that idea of small group discussions, which we see is at the heart of a seminar course locally, we want to try to bring that online as well. And one of the things Philip will be saying a little bit more about it is about the way that we've taken that there's been more than 24,000 people who registered for the class. We've divided them into smaller groups where they can have more localized conversations and discussions. And we think that will be critical to the class, discussing the readings, discussing the panel conversations here, discussing the hands-on activities that they'll be participating in. So we hope to share at least some of the same spirit of the class here with the online participants. Of course, our group at MIT can personally participate in all those groups, but we hope that the groups will be able to be able to take form on their own and support those types of conversations. One thing that gives me hope just in the early days of looking at the signups on the course, first of all, already there's been lots of great interaction and conversation in the uh, online Google Plus community. And it's clear that people have lots of interesting ideas to share. And just from the people who have signed up, we see there are lots of people with great experience and expertise in these areas. So there are lots of people out there in the community that are very, that are very well positioned to be able to be active contributors and supporters of those small group discussions. So they think there's a great opportunity for people to, to have those ongoing conversations around these issues online. And in fact, for me, that's one of the most important outcomes of an experimental course like this is to see how it is that we can bring together a community of what I call kindred spirits, of people who share some of our ideas and ideals about creative learning and help them interact with each other. So if the I think that's more important than anything we can provide from MIT is just providing a space for like-minded people to find one another, interact with each other, and start talking with one another. And hopefully that will happen you know, through this course. Maybe I'll hand over to Philip if there's more things you want to say about the online infrastructure for the class. OK. So again, it will be an online conversation. I know that already we're, there's a lot of, for the online part of the class, there's a lot of just thought about how we're going to continue to iterate the different infrastructures and the different ways people can collaborate. We'll be putting more information online. I know Philip has already talked with some of the online participants, we'll be putting up more uh, information about ways that people you know, can, you know, can support their groups. And... <laughs> okay, I think you, you discussed, you, you come at really well kind of the bigger ideas. And then the, the nitty gritty is really um, that we have placed people in groups either if they selected to be in groups with their friends 
or by time zone, because we're hoping that they will have a chance to work with each other in real time as well. So we'll uh, suggest to them that they get together on a Hangout uh, specifically. Um, and there's a course homepage, which is learn.media.mit.edu, which is really the core landing place for all the online uh, participants. But maybe the one thing that I, I hope will also come out of this is that um, it's, I mean, this is a fantastic opportunity to be uh, in a small group of people that all passionately care about these things with some of the world's experts kind of discussing and tinkering and working hands-on every week. But there's also something nice about this huge online community of people who are as passionate about these ideas as some of you are and some of the things they've already come up with. Uh, so we, we've kind of made this very open for people to come up with new ideas and one person went ahead and created a Google map and then hundreds of people added their little pins where they are and started discussing oh, what's the best way to structure this map and like it, you know, you get to kind of the, we hit the threshold where Google starts breaking the map into multiple pages and then they were discussing the threshold, none of which we had any idea about or any participation in, but it, it was awesome to see. And now we're trying to do a kind of a gallery of video introductions and just kind of surfacing all these interesting perspectives that people bring in the background and so I'm hoping that on like we we talk a lot about like opening up the media lab to the world so that people outside can get a glimpse of what's happening here and have access to some of these op opportunities. But to some degree, I, I feel like uh, us stepping out there is also great for us to kind of see more perspectives and 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 touch more people. Um, and yeah, the nitty gritty is really just that that core page. Uh, in addition, and then there's a link at the top to a Google Plus community, uh, which already has more than five thousand people in it, and it's totally crazy uh, and exciting and so those two things are really kind of the main anchor points and if the students here would participate in that I'm, you know we'd be happy to help with that great yeah and for the students here we'll have our own group of interaction with the group here and as the semester goes on we'll see whether it makes sense to have different forms of interaction between the local group and the online group uh, maybe just before we close the session for today we'll give a little forward pointer to things for next week and for those of you locally, we'll continue to be around and can follow up more deeply with this. But just for, to give a little look ahead for next week, as we mentioned, next week, it'll be on Tuesday of next week, we'll have uh, Mimi Ito and Joey Ito talking about interest-based learning. And in preparation for that, the activity for next week is to read, in addition to the general readings for the week about interest-based learning, we're going to ask you to read a very short essay that Seymour Papert wrote it was the foreword to his 1980 book, Mindstorms. And the foreword was called Gears of My Childhood. And Seymour talked about uh, how at a very young age, he started experimenting and playing with gears and how those early play experiences formed a foundation for a lot of his later learning. Learning about some particular mathematical ideas that influenced him as he went on. But maybe even more importantly, about the importance of forming a connection to the materials that you're working with. Uh, in, in the essay, he, ta he talks about how he fell in love with gears and how big a difference that made, that sort of he became passionate about it. So it connects again to the theme of interest-based learning. What we'll be asking you to do for the activity of the week is reflecting upon this, and we also have other examples online of people writing about their childhood objects in the spirit of Seymour's gears will be asking you to think about objects in your childhood that both you know, influenced you, the way you think about things, that objects in your childhood that, you know, that, that both interested you and influenced you as you moved along. As I said, on, this is a, a topic that my colleague Sherry Turkle has asked many people to write about their childhood objects, has several books published on people's essays about their childhood objects. We put a few examples online. You could take a look at those. And we'll be asking you to write and share about your own childhood objects that interested and influenced you. Uh, one final note is that for the local people, we're going to be doing a hands-on activity for the rest of the session today. And we're going to encourage the people online to participate in the same activity at some point in the next week. So I was going to give a brief background to the activity now. And We'll be doing it here at MIT in the next hour, and people in their groups online can talk about the ways that they can uh, 
organize these activities and share their experiences. It's an activity called the Marshmallow Challenge that some of you might have heard of. It's an activity where you take a certain fixed set of materials, uh, spaghetti, tape, string, and marshmallow. And for those around the world who don't have access to marshmallows, there are other things that could be used. But you use this a fixed set of materials. You use it to build an interesting freestanding structure. And the entire marshmallow must be put on top of the structure. And you do this in 18 minutes. So we'll be breaking into groups. We typically do this in groups of four. And uh, we'll be having seeing what different people do in this design activity, and then reflecting on the design activity. And then we'll be looking at a video that we'll share online for the online participants, a pointer to a TED Talk that talks about this activity and talks about the experiences of a wide range of different people, from kindergarten students to, uh, to corporate executives who have participated in this challenge. And we'll look, reflect on your own experiences and then think about how other people have undertaken this challenge. So that'll be a hands-on activity for people to work on uh, and share their ideas around, either in class or online. So then for next week, we'll do the readings about interest-based learning, an uh, essay about your childhood object. Uh, online, we'll have more explanations of, of what we suggest as some starting points for group discussions for people online and for the local people to discuss. And with that, I think we'll close the first session. As I look at my watch, we're pretty much on time, pretty much at an hour. And we'll try to keep this to an hour each week. Uh, and we'll then archive it online for people who can't join us uh, in real time. So until next week, uh, look forward to seeing you in Learning Creative Learning.